Um, it's actually the first time we are in Moscow. It's actually the second day that we're here and we're really excited to be here. And also um, we're really looking forward to the coming week at Strelka with uh, the Digital Earth uh, Fellows. And um, we basically got invited or by Nikolai to give a um, kind of a conceptual framework for the Digital Earth project, where it's coming from and the background. So that's the aim of our lecture today. Um, but let me first uh, introduce ourselves. Um, so next to me is um, uh, Leonardo de la Noche, and I'm a co-initiator of Digital Earth Project and um, um, art historian. We have been working for two years now on several projects. Uh, Vertical Atlas is one of them, together with Benjamin Breton, um, and uh, currently indeed the Digital Earth Project. And my background is also uh, art history. Um, uh, I'm from the Netherlands, Leonardo is from Italy, as you might know b yeah. because of the name. <laughs> You're gonna hear it, I think, very soon. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, like um, my interest is also um, very much focused on the intersection of arts, design, technology, and specifically on um, a research topic I'm engaging in since some time now, which is petrocultures in um, oil states. But now uh, back to digital earth. Um, Nikolai already explained the aim of the project, but just to uh, maybe um, say it again, really our aim of this project is to explore our current technological reality from a truly planetary perspective and on a planetary scale with art and design as navigational tools. So that's the aim of the project. And you might wonder why. Why are we f currently focusing on this? And because um, the main reason why we're doing this is because this technological reality we live in has become increasingly more complex and difficult to understand. And uh, that relates to the fact that it's all around us and inside us and it became so big that it's very hard to, comp uh, to understand its entirety. Imagine, for example, planet Earth um, being totally wrapped by fiber optic cables um, and electromagnetic waves. Um, and at the same time, the planet's surface, uh, surface being drilled by oil companies and by um, gas companies for the resources to create, uh, to generate the energy that is at the same time then providing uh, data centers uh, with the energy to drill the digital skin of the earth for cryptocurrencies. So just as a kind of metaphor to understand this kind of complex reality we live in. Um, also imagine the um, phone or the computer that you're maybe now holding in your hands as a kind of portal gun or a kind of entry point to a truly planetary accidental mega structure um, that connects the, these mines and these lithium mines, let's say in Chile, um, with data centers, offshore data centers maybe in Russia or fiber optic um, submarine cables under the Atlantic oceans to maybe the free ports in Singapore um, to again the orbit and the, and the sky where there are satellites floating around to the swelling quantity of IP addresses and uh, teraflops of data just as a kind of you know, um, um, metaphor of this complex um, digital reality we live in. And our aim is really to investigate this reality. Um, um, and um, maybe to reference back to Benjamin Breton, who is, um, I guess, familiar to uh, most of you. Um, whom of you um, know Benjamin Breton, actually? Just to have an idea. Um, uh, <laughs> I, okay, some, hands. some hands, yeah. Okay, so... Um, Maybe, uh, yeah, maybe let's say something about Benjamin Breton um, uh, as a start <laughs> then. <laughs> no, if everyone is familiar with the, with the st stack idea and the stack like approach, then we are not gonna dive into that too much, but we're gonna reference it uh, during the talk. Yeah, um, but like how he reference or like he, how he calls this kind of situation we're in, he says it's an accidental mega structure of planetary scale computation. So it's really accidental and it's a mega structure all around us. Um, it's a technological infrastructure that is so big that it's all around us. You can experience its effects, but we can't comprehend its entirety. Um, so the presentation today 
Um, we're going to talk about this digital earth project that we're doing with 20 artists and designers at the moment to look at this technological mesh, um, this um, mega structure that we find ourselves in. And Leonardo will start now um, uh, with providing a kind of historical overview of scholars, of scientists, of designers um, um, that have tried to understand this digital planetary situation, did, yeah, like this situation we found ourselves in, people like El Gore, Buckminster Fuller, um, and others. And afterwards, uh, we are going to explain the project, its urgency, and uh, how we relate to this history. Um, and then there is room for questions uh, and answers and discussions. Uh, yes, so over the past uh, 50 years, different scholars, artists, and even politicians like Al Gore, vice president of, of Bill Clinton, and then also try, uh, candidate, presidential candidate you, the, the, in the US, sort of try to understand or to interface this type of um, technological reality and like earth sciences, etc. So perhaps we can start uh, a bit earlier than the 90s. Uh, type of globalization that Al Gore and the US especially uh, were champions. Uh, we found actually uh, Peter Sloterdijk very interesting here to kind of create a sort of structure of how we might understand globalization. This is open for grabs, it's arguable that this is the precise structure, but what is interesting is that um, he explains how in the beginning, let's say, uh, among the ancient Greeks, there was this idea of the sphere. The sphere was this, uh, the perfect uh, geometrical shape, and therefore the universe that was supported by these unknowable ideas of Plato or Aristotle, etc., was the cosmos. So we, we found ourselves as humans in a sphere. That was the universe. We were looking at this sort of dome in the sky. Modernity, so the modern age, completely changed that, that, uh, that perspective. So we have people like Kepler, like Copernicus, actually uh, debunking this sphere, uh, this universal sphere in which we find ourselves in, and actually using uh, the sky as a point of view to look at Earth little by little. So modernity is about cartography, modernity is about mapping the Earth, because the Earth is not anymore as much as a sphere, but it's more of an imperfect globe. You know, it has mountains, geology is different, so you have to sort of map this unevenness to uh, get a grasp on it. And lately, uh, Sloterdijk mentions that we are in a sort of electronic globalization. So uh, the Earth has been mapped, so to speak, and the, the space disappears in a way. It's like Earth is despecialized, he says. So the only space is the one between networks of computer. So we find ourselves in what he calls a planetary interior. So there is no outside to the planet. Outside is just cold, dark space. There is no way to get out, not even conceptually anymore like the Greek did. So the first one, um, so digital Earth, probably you heard it for the first time uh, by Al Gore. So in a way is a, a recognized precursor of this, um, of this name, uh, whom in 1998 at the California Institute for Sciences laid out a new vision for the future, a technological vision of the future. So Gore described digital Earth as a spinning virtual globe, an interface that you could hold in the palm of your hands. So you have this globe and you can just browse around it and see all the data that you find on it. Actually, um, this globe, it was envisioned to be a representation and a tool to work with all the data captured by like a fleet of satellites that was both corporate and military, which is a very important detail, and all the sensors under the sea, above the ground, and so forth. And then different um, computers around the world will process this uh, immense quantity of data and then smoothly uh, represent it in this interface. So there was a big ambition for that, eh? like now it sounds like a ridiculous project, but it was presented with the uh, early ambitions of the internet. So really a sort of distributed network for knowledge sharing. And the, the main aim was to advance the earth sciences, like understanding uh, climate and climate change, but also to empower a sort of new global citizen that could really like go around the planet um, with this globe. And for us, that's kind of obvious because we have Google Maps, but there was nothing like that in 1998. But Gore sort of took inspiration uh, from uh, back Mr. Fuller. And this is, this is actually not what I'm gonna talk about, but gives you a feeling of the style of geodesic domes that Fuller had created around, around the US. So this is a biosphere he created in 1967. He envisioned a similar project to be called the Geoscope. And that happened in 1962. The project was never realized. 
And uh, this geoscope would have been a 61 uh, meter globe uh, in, the, in, in diameter, made of glass and steel and light bulbs that would basically show historical and live data of what happened and what's happening on Earth. Wars, um, wildlife, uh, you name it, earthquakes, etc. This project was not realized, uh, but he actually proposed another one to the UN, a much bigger dome to be placed in New York, which function was to give the policymakers of the UN a tool to understand what happened when they made a decision. This was not, I mean, politically, I don't think he had many supporters in that, but also, like, technically, there were not the sensors and the technological capacity to actually have all this live feed of data captured from the different parts of the world. If, if you fast forward to 2010, uh, the World Economic Forum online has been writing about uh, the sharing economy in space. We are not going to dive too much about into the, into the sharing economy itself. But what's interesting is that they claim that in five to ten years, satellite infrastructure will be much cheaper, which is also kind of true. I don't know if you know uh, Trevor Paklen. He just shoot an artwork in, a, in orbit together with many other packages that were on the same, on the same ride. Um, so, like, they, pro they say, okay, we're going to have this sharing economy and it's going to base on the satellite infrastructure. So, potentially, you can just take a picture of your house with Airbus satellite because there, is this, there are these new services provided by corporations. So, even if you're a small private, you can get this type of service. But also, this implies that, of course, a lot of more data about the Earth will be produced by way of these uh, um, type of services. And you could that could have a lot of applications. They envision wildlife protection and surveillance, climate change monitoring, which of course is becoming increasingly important. But they also point out that this massive amount of data uh, is called the um, uh, digital twin of Earth. So they, they, the World Economic Forum mentioned it, like really, this is gonna be a digital twin of Earth. So you cannot compare really uh, bytes with kilograms, of course, but it's interesting this kind of uh, grandeur of the name, this, this idea of twinning the Earth somehow, whether it's conceptually and now it's digitally. Recently, and this is very recent, is a news from the 1st of November this year, uh, a new project was, uh, was launched called the Earth Biogenome Project. So it was launched in London by a series of universities and uh, genetic uh, corporations. And the aim of this project is to map the entire genome of complex life forms on Earth. So map it, sequence it, and then store it digitally for, well, I guess there are different applications and different profits you can make from these. But this is a serious project, project because 4.7 billions were already invested into it. And it's a sort of sequel of the UNA, U, sorry, <clears throat> UMA, Human Genome Project uh, of the second half of the 20th century. And of course, here again, they're expecting trillions of megabytes, like all the bytes that you have on YouTube and Twitter combined in terms of a genetic code. So we don't know uh, what kind of representation of the planet will come out, this, uh, this genetic research, but again, this kind of techno-deterministic attempt to, uh, to really go to the granular scale and know whatever it is to be known on the surface of Earth. So there is always this layer of omni omniscience, so the, uh, the will to know whatever it is on the planet. The kind of idea that you can control it, that uh, all these things are, uh, are to be known. But the problem of um, these kind of projects and the, um, the trying to create interfaces of representation departing from this data you gather is that you, you're gonna logically and without doubt reduce the complexity of what happens on Earth. So in this strive for omniscience, um, these corporations, all these projects and this proposal um, leave out big portions of the complex reality um, they aim to map in the first place. So especially for the Digital Earth um, project of Al Gore, um, we, we talked with uh, Lisa Parks, who is a scholar from the US, and she's a mentor of, our, of ours, of, of, of the fellows, so she's part of our project. And already 20 years ago, uh, in 1998, so when Gore mentioned Digital Earth the first time, she wrote this very interesting paper that I will suggest to you, titled Satellites and Cyber Visualities Analyzing the Digital Earth. And in this uh, paper, she makes two main points that are also um, the urgency, in a way, we feel on why to engage with this type of quest. So the first one, as you can see from the PowerPoint, is the smoothening of political, ecological, cultural, and societal frictions. So one of the problems of Algor Earth is that this digital Earth as interface 
speaks first for a national and corporate smoothening of the difference and frictions in line with the globalization project that was the American one of the 90s. So as she says, um, by mapping all these spaces, actually the interface conceals, uh, conceals other spaces and naturalizes this sort of control, this property that this American or Western spectator or navigator of the planet um, has. So it's a way to own the planet and a specific version of it. And she traced that back to the tendency or like uh, the habit of having a globe in your house or in your studio or subscribing to National Geographic. So she finds these uh, as part of very much of Western cultural practices. So while this orbital view uh, of the digital Earth can lead to an actual understanding of the chaotic complexity of the planet, its smoothening in a sleek interface diminishes the, its critical potential. And the second point is the concealing of the material infrastructure that makes the interface possible in the first place. In Al Gore's vision, you don't see the uh, US Army satellites. You don't see all the sensors and all the infrastructure that is owned by someone and is placed there for a reason. So concealing, um, once again, and make it look the interface seamless as if that's the only representation of reality, or of a global reality that you can have. But this material basis is not all in terms of infrastructure. Of course, you have the fiber optic cables that uh, Arthur mentioned first, and the data servers. Of course, you have the broadband, uh, broadband antennas made of steel. But the materiality of this digital reality in which we live in is also much deeper. It goes down to the chemicals, to the minerals, to the rare earth um, rocks that are mined by Chinese corporations in Africa. Because if you don't have coltan, you, don't, you cannot make a smartphone. If you don't have lithium from Chile or from Afghanistan, you cannot make a battery. So you cannot make a, a, a smart car, for instance. This picture, this picture um, brings another material aspect that is the one of temperature, for instance, of warmth. These data servers, these minerals that are heated up in the processor create warmth. And this is a, a, um, quite, a, quite a big technical problem that there is in computation. Microsoft, with this uh, project Natic, uh, has tried a prototype to use the, the seawater from the ocean. So lay down these self-sufficient data servers on the bottom of the ocean, and the water will cool down the server by itself so that you can place it there for some years, and it's just going to work. So temperatures. Uh, you have uh, many people mining bitcoins, and bitcoins requires a lot of electricity. So you'll find them in Kosovo, and it's a certain portion of Kosovo where you don't pay electricity because there is a legal loophole, so you don't pay it and you can just mine as much as you want. You find them in Inner Mongolia, you find them perhaps in Iceland, where the climate actually influences uh, the way computation happens. And for these, uh, the work of UC Parika is very relevant. He published if I'm not wrong, in 2015, uh, 2016, I can't remember correctly, uh, Geology of Media. It goes on to the media side of things, uh, and it traced it back to this influx, this input of chemicals and materials, whether that's oil, whether that's uh, the rare earth minerals, and, um, and then it speaks also about the output. So we can see this warmth from the data server as a residual uh, sort of uh, material, uh, as a debris of the computation. And so it speaks about waste, contamination, toxicity. And uh, you, might, you might know that like, our technological reality leaves very clear ge geophysical traces. There, are, there is a, a famous um, uh, e-waste dump in uh, Ghana. There, are, there is another one in China where all um, the devices are just dumped there and they're burned to extract again copper, etc. And now it feels it's, it's kind of remote for certain users like us, this, this toxicity, this, this reality, this material toxicity of technology. But actually, Silicon Valley itself, as Ingrid Burlington exposed in, a, in an interesting paper on Influx, has a very toxic heritage. Underneath the Apple campus that is all sleek and amazing, this amazing donut with the forest, actually the soil is contaminated by the extraction of silicon in the Silicon Valley from sand. From sand. So the very way we see our digital reality has these two sides of the same story. What It became increasingly difficult now perhaps to trace it because the scale of operation now is very much planetary. This is a beautiful picture of lithium, uh, lithium mines that have this aesthetic side, as you can see with the different colors. Chile is um, 
I think geologically Chile has one of the biggest pools of lithium together with Colombia, but also Afghanistan has one. And now I think uh, the US Army start, US corporation started mining there as a reparation for, uh, for war is part of the deals, which is also another interesting point. But back to the planetarity of this materiality. So things are, are, are remote now, perhaps. It becomes even increasingly difficult to map where these materials come from, where they go, and why. And for this, the work of uh, Vladar uh, Yoller and Kate Crawford is a very interesting one. They, uh, they work uh, with data scientists and artists, like Vladar is um, an artist himself. Uh, you might know them because they kind of uh, backtraced how the Facebook algorithm works. But this work uh, specifically has been uh, published in September this year. And uh, it's titled Anatomy of AI. Uh, they have a nice website, just Google them, and you're going to find them. And here, um, what, what they've done is to understand how actually Amazon Alexa, so the artificial intelligence of, of Amazon, works. Where are the materials coming from? What are like, the work practices that make your Amazon Echo, if you own one, possible in the first place? So what they found out is that like, this artificial intelligence and this cloud platform uh, actually infrastructure, because Amazon provides infrastructure, for example, for Uber to work and, and other corporations. Um, what, what's supporting it? And they found, of course, that subjugating work practices are part of the picture, that traumatic material extractions are part of the picture. So these kind of tortuous lines that you see in, in the diagram to link back that pollution to actually the cloud computation of Amazon are pretty much a straight line of, of, of this platform. And here is what Arthur was mentioning in the first place, the stack by Benjamin Bratton, that I guess you have seen in this courtyard quite some time already. Uh, the ties, again, this earth, this earth layer that we, we have been speaking about, this materiality uh, of, um, of the minerals, of the oil, of the gas, to the cloud, the cloud that is both uh, fiber optic cables, but also the very data that are in the data servers, all the way up through the infrastructure to basically get to you for any simple update that your smartphone might have, computer, and well, the picture is much more complicated than that, but we don't want to spend too much time uh, on, um, on the stack. So to wrap up this, this first part, we spoke about uh, how the planet was thought through uh, from the ancient Greek, from this Western cosmology point of view, uh, how it is mapped, uh, its immaterial, the immateriality of the digital and its materiality, and how these things are visualized or concealed or smoothened out, and what are the problems in, in, uh, in these different actions. Uh, now Arthur will actually dive in the second, I don't know if it's upper or lower layer of the Digital Earth project, uh, which is the cultural imaginations that are attached to um, this technological uh, digital reality we live in. Yeah, um, indeed, because besides indeed the politics that we just addressed, the first points, and the materiality of the techno uh, technology that uh, Leonardo just addressed, there are also um, um, cultural uh, dimensions and um, 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 because indeed um, technology is really based on a cultural context, of course, and that's another, I think, um, important element to discuss. Um, um, let's say the smartphone that I just addressed that is in your pocket. Um, that's, of course, like a specific cultural product from a specific area, um, which you might know. Um, which is Silicon Valley, um, um, which its own aesthetics, like, of course, the beanbags, the startup culture, and this global spread of a certain, um, yeah, technological worldview. Um, um, and this is really spreading now all across the world. Like, I've been in Africa and seen exactly similar spaces, and also, um, I guess, there are quite some number of, like, these co-working spaces here in Russia. Um, uh, so, that's the kind of Silicon Valley aesthetics, but there's of course also the internet, which is, of, which is really American. It's designed and implemented according to a specific ideology. Uh, and as we know, the internet was developed by the ARPANET, which is a military project which the American corporations and universities participated. And now it, uh, it is the main global standard across the world. 
uh, but the widespread global use of the American internet might create the emergence of new parallel standards like other types of technological realities. And we are in the Digital Earth Project specifically inter interested in these other technologies. Um, and these technologies have their own diversity and also their own kinds of aesthetics. Think, for example, about Chinese technologies and um, uh, specific use of them. Um, um, like, I think most of you are familiar with the Great Firewall, the Great Chinese Firewall, um, which shelters the online environment from the outside in China, or the AI developments brought forward by Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent, and how these AI is specifically trained on Chinese data and creating a radically different AI than, for example, the Google AI would be. Um, and Breton um, um, actually also provided a very um, interesting insight in this kind of diversity of technological realities. And he calls this with a very um, difficult word. Um, um, oh. Yeah, we are already there. The multipolar hemispherical stacks, um, uh, which is a concept to understand this geographic diversity within this planetary technological reality. And um, um, I, yeah, we wrote down three examples of these kinds of stacks globally. The first one I think is, uh, is familiar to uh, some of you, which is Google, Amazon, Facebook, and Apple related to the American kind of um, um, zone, uh, but then there's also the Chinese one, which is Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent. And um, to our surprise, Benjamin also uh, identified a kind of Russian stack, um, uh, which he called MIVKT, uh, which is based on mail.ru, Yandex, Vcontacted, and Telegram. So um, <laughs> that's actually also interested, um, uh, interesting for this uh, specific uh, location. Um, and together with him, that's also maybe uh, worth mentioning, we're doing a project which is called Vertical Atlas, in which we're actually trying to map these different stacks and these different uh, localities and, and uh, emergence of technologies across the globe. Um, also worth uh, and important to mention that uh, Benjamin um, um, like uh, stated that these uh, stacks are not necessarily connected to geographical zones. So the American stack, for example, the GAFA stack, might appear also in Europe. Or the BAT stack um, um, can emerge um, um, also, let's say, in a Chinese-owned uh, uh, lithium mine in Africa. Or um, um, even within your WeChat application, if some of you have them in your phone, it can be also considered part of the Chinese um, um, yeah, uh, si yeah, Chinese cyberspace, basically. And uh, what is interesting for Digital Earth is the fact that Breton envisions the emergence of the technological biodiversity linked to each stack and each geography. And this also relates to the argument of uh, Sloterdijk, as Leonardo already mentioned, that the planetary interior is not a whole, but is constituted by multiple poles that there is no outside and that the technological and planetary insight is plural, it's multipolar. And that brings us to the next point, uh, which relates to this one, um, um, but is slightly more deeper and philosophical. And that is that the technological diversity is also rooted in different cosmologies. And the emergence of this reality is, all, is um, like in the relation between cosmology and techniques is uh, studied by um, a Chinese philosopher uh, that we have talked to and that we find very inspiring, which is called uh, Yu Kui. Um, uh, yeah, it's over here. And um, he wrote a book which is called The Question Concerning Technology in China. And he really builds on both a continental European philosophical tradition as well as Chinese philosophy and a Chinese philosophical tradition. And Yuk, we stresses in his book the importance of cosmology. Uh, and cosmology basically means the study of the origin, the evolution, and the eventual fate of the universe. And um, I guess you might know these different cosmologies like, let's say, the Mayan cosmology or the Celtic, or maybe there's a Chinese or a Russian cosmology or like traditions. 
And according um, um, to Juk, the techniques and technology are part of these cosmologies and the myths associated with it. For example, uh, in the Greek cosmology, Prometheus is the one who brought the techniques uh, to the humans, like agriculture or crafts. And around the world, the story of how techniques were created in different, um, in, yeah, in different contexts depends on this cosmology, and he calls this cosmotechnics. Um, Yuk Wee focused in his book mostly on like this Chinese cosmology and how this relates to techniques. Um, uh, but there are other scholars that are also related to um, uh, our project um, that are studying this relation between cosmology and planetary technology from other geographical zones. And um, um, I'm going to mention a few of them. Um, Klepperton Mavunga, Ron Eglash, and Tegan Bristow, um, because they have studied different African knowledge systems and cosmotechnics and how they change technology. Um, an example is uh, Tegan Bristow, who studied the relationship between, tech, uh, between technological and cultural knowledges in Africa, such as the history of African mathematics, African fractals, um, which you can see here on the left, and geometric algorithms in beadwork and weaving designs. Uh, which you see here on the right. Um, Eglash, as well as Steg and Bristow, studied the different uses for fractals through aerial footages of African villages and concluded that these algorithms are a shared technology across Africa. And by looking into these traditions of algorithmic thinking from Africa, um, uh, like the main aim of Tegan, um, um, but also of, um, um, of the other scholars, is to almost decolonize the notion that the technological knowledges are brought from the West. Eh? Like they are really deeply rooted in these African knowledge systems. And we are by no means experts like uh, Leonardo and I in these, um, um, in these fields, but we find it super inter interesting and fascinating uh, as part of this Digital Earth research project and to learn from them. Um, with the Digital Earth Project, we are not interested so much in an anthropology of technology to see how some, like, arguably universal technology is used in different contexts, or to see if there is a planetary shared technological now, but rather we want to complicate the picture, to do away with the visual and theoretical smooth surface of the, uh, the Digital Earth that you mentioned from El Gore. And in order to look at the world in all its aesthetic, political, and cultural unevenness. And that's why this program focuses on artists and designers from different geographical regions as well. Um, to summarize um, um, this kind of theoretical conceptual framework, um, um, we, we, we um, um, yeah, like identified three main points why we're doing this project. And the first one, um, yeah, is we, uh, we started to support artistic and design practices that reveal the different material and immaterial manifestations of the complex technological en entanglement we find ourselves in. And that's also what Leonardo explained with this material aspect and this immaterial aspect. And we're really trying through art and design practices to um, uh, unravel this and to, to locate this. Um, the second one is that we want to complicate the narrative of a universal technological standard by really working in these different geographical regions. And the third one is that we investigate this complex uh, condition through aesthetic strategies and methodologies because we work yeah, with design and artists. Um, now we would like to go very concrete what the project is about. Um, um, and that's um, the Digital Earth Fellowship. Um, and very concretely, what it actually is, um, is that we are working with 20 artists and designers, like from Africa and Asia. And we started in October. We work for six months with each of these fellows. We provide them with um, um, a stipend for research and experimentation into this technological reality, into this infrastructure globally. Um, and to produce eventually a work or like a research outcome after these six months. Um, 
A second element that we provide as part of this digital earth is that together with the new center for research and practice have developed a um, Google Classroom by leading scholars, by artists and by designers. And um, it works actually remarkably well that every one of the fellows logs in from their geographic location. I, I guess they can also give a feedback here <laughs> of how good feedback. it is, but... Uh... Yeah, but overall like... Some people joined in that classroom and it worked with, um, um, yeah, with the internet connections. Uh, so that's the second part of the, of the digital earth-like kind of uh, tools that we provide. And uh, the third one is that we provide access to research locations across Africa and Asia. Uh, Asia. And currently these research locations are Ashkal Awan, the Kronos Art Center, Kersi Yossan, Kosh Workshop, of course, Trelka, where we are now, and Electric South. And like within these research locations, we have workshops like what we are having the coming days with, uh, with Nikolai, um, um, or seminars or residencies to really investigate this technological reality from that specific geographical zone. The network is also a bit broader, like um, we are working also with Lisa Parks and her department uh, from MIT as well, but they, they are not located in any of these continents, like uh, the new Center for Research and Practice, so in different ways we're probably going to do something in Tanzania together with them. And there are also other institutions we are talking to for different moment of the, of the project, I would say. And, uh, and then actually since it's so distributed that, and like people met I think in real life today the first time, the five fellows who are here, um, it's very much based on the relation with, uh, with different mentors so each fellow uh, can, can have two, uh, two private, uh, yeah, private mentors. And one, is, for instance, uh, Nikolai is one of them, Ben Bratton, Reza Negarstani, Parika and like artists, uh, designers and, and curators. Um, that, are, that have been working in Europe, in Asia, in Africa, and so forth. And uh, we, yeah, we would like just to mention again like the, um, the link to Vertical Atlas. If someone of you has a taste for cartography, uh, geography, technology, and everything else uh, like that, we are now, uh, as Arthur said, developing this project. That, that we, it's within uh, the umbrella of Digital Earth very much. It's perhaps a different iteration. It happens mostly uh, in the Netherlands, but we're going to publish uh, a book of findings of maps. It's going to be an actual atlas. And we are focusing on these uh, MHS, multipolar hemispherical stacks. So it's going to be also on African stack, Chinese stack, and the uh, Middle Eastern one, with uh, including the Gulf. Um, so I guess... We have here five, uh, five fellows, and they might, I guess, join us for the Q&A session if called upon. I know they don't want to, but uh, it might be the case because we don't want to speak, of course, on, on their behalf. And that will be it. Thank you. Any of you guys ha, hiding in the in the crowd? Someone feels like. Yeah. I mean, maybe you can raise your hands, and at the bar you can take a more informal this. So please, can you raise your hands? Uh, great. <laughs> so memorize their faces. So, yeah. I think maybe just in very oh, one, one sentence what yeah. it is about, if, if, you, uh, if you like. <laughs> okay, I think they don't have a taste for that at the moment. So maybe, uh, actually today they presented their project, so maybe Nikolai wants to say no, words, <laughs> or I can... I uh, you have a question. I have a question, actually. Okay. Uh, I, okay. Behalf, I, I think that, um, I guess my question was, what do you think, because this is a quite an interesting and obviously uh, connected quite a lot to, to the, the research teams that we're interested in here in the program. So I guess the question for everyone would be, uh, what do you think is the value of looking at these topics from the Africa, Asia, Russia perspective? I mean, the, 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 the you're, you're referring to digital earth. Yes. Yeah, so okay. You, uh, focus on these topics from that particular context, which uh, might seem un unconventional. So. Yes, um, maybe I can 
can jump in. Uh, I think this relates very much to, um, to the work of UI and, uh, and really the cosmotechnics because like the, the thesis there is that there is no um, sort of technological universality. So like digital technology as we use it now doesn't need to be like, of course there is a material basis set that influences what, what's possible and what not, but like uh, a truly African way could could be completely different. They might have different techniques and, and therefore like engender a different technology. So we wanted a bit to get out of um, our Western canon in a way uh, because we found like a lack of uh, cultural and political imaginations about the future. And like our, our proposal was like, hey, there might be someone around the world that coming from a very different yeah, cosmological or cultural background has insights on that that we just we just don't know about. So what about like bringing these people together and communicate? And we actually have to say that uh, also with our partners across Asia and Africa, we, we have met them in, in South Africa, for instance, and it was very nice to see how they were linking, um, very much linking things and finding a common ground to talk uh, about, um, about technology and really saying, hey, I have to bring you to India because this is, what you're doing here in South Africa is so relevant to our own context and your view on these specific problem or implication of a certain technology can really open up a different set of questions or give us different answers. Does that... Uh, okay, great. So the question is why we don't include scientists or... Okay, yeah. <laughs> fair enough. Uh, maybe you take this one. <laughs> um, I think we uh, started with, um, um, like, well, we started with this project actually like three months ago. So it's like then the actual fellowship started. And um, um, we wanted to start with artists and designers because we thought um, this kind of technological reality that we're in, like it can become so big and so abstract that it's quite hard to visualize and to understand it. So we wanted to take like the kind of aesthetic approach, um, uh, like through film, like through design, like through um, artistic research as, um, as, as a first entry point into this uh, kind of topic. So to really like map out, like to see like how, how does this um, uh, visualize and like, um, um, yeah, uh, how does this visualize in different uh, geographical zones? But like in the future, we are very interested to maybe expand this research and include like scientists, like um, um, uh, yeah, and academics into this into this research. But we really wanted to start first to go out of this kind of cognitive like paper-based research and really start to actually visualize, okay, um, where are these lithium mines? How do they look like? Um, um, where, uh, how is the infrastructure of the port systems uh, and the ports in Lagos? How, how does this work? And, and, and how can we make this more tangible to really have this kind of abstract notion of the stack more concrete and like, yeah, tangible? Yeah, and to emphasize on what, what Arthur said, we also felt that perhaps an artistic uh, method on these very topics has been a bit underrepresented perhaps. And so we really wanted to kind of like foster that to, to support it because you know, earth sciences and other like hardcore science has been very much um, involved with this type of topics already. And there was a frame for this type of knowledge production, much more that we felt the sort of artistic uh, or, or design uh, knowledge production uh, has. So that's, that's just a moment to set up this frame. So if this frame actually works and we are planning to do more editions, then definitely linking, let's say, to the scientific method and see how artistic and scientific method can inform each other possibly. That's for sure. I mean, that's really the final aim, I think. But this is the, the prototype. It's the alpha test in a way. So the, I think the easy answer is our partner, the new center, is based on Google, 
classroom. So they are not here, so they cannot defend themselves. Um, but, <laughs> but of course, um, perhaps this relates again to this kind of planetary interior. Like there is no outside, I, th I think, uh, from this technological condition and from the stack, right? Like even my grandma just having a landline in a different way than myself going always around with the smartphone is part of this. Even if you're like sort of like a, um, a dark character in the video game, this kind of void, you're sort of mapped by just the fact that everyone is around you, I guess. That's, uh, that's one, but sure, like we have many questions actually on how we did the project, both in terms of this technology or a question of like uh, uh, coloniality as well in setting up the entire framework. I mean, these are all things that we've, we've been uh, addressing and we're gonna keep addressing, but yeah, it's, uh, it's a good point. Go for it. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that that can be perhaps a, a second a second step. Like uh, for now, we really kind of um, brought together a series of like partners. Yeah? Like we also have to mention that this project is supported by Evo's British Council and CEDA, which is a Swedish fund. So we we also start from we are depart from a specific starting point that perhaps is about the logistics and how and bureaucracy, etc. And then like. If we uh, manage also to create our, I guess, framework in this kind of bureaucratic way, et cetera, then probably we can even take a more radical step, uh, I guess, towards that. Can I also just, sorry, ask a follow-up on that follow-up in the sense that was, was the, I'm wondering whether was the desire to, because you mentioned critique the stack, was that ever an attempt? Was that ever an ambition of the project to actually challenge the, the foundations of the model, which in itself is like a so-called agnostic um, not maybe to criticize it, but maybe more to unravel it or to investigate it uh, from different geographical locations. So um, it's always nice to have a kind of starting point. And well, we are of course like quite inspired and like. Yeah, like we read the stack and we use that as one of the bases of this project. And then it's like through this different, um, yeah, kind of research in different geographical zones, we can kind of unpack it or challenge it. But it's not per se that it's like really critiquing or like aimed at critiquing the model. Yeah, that's a problem with VPN, for sure, to speak uh, with the Chinese fellows. Would that be a form of kind of moving beyond the colonial No, I mean... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, the stack, of course, is one of the bases, but it's not the only one. So, like, it's not a one-to-one kind of project just based on the stack. that We find uh, enriching, eh? it can give a really interesting perspective. But at the same time, it is a conceptual model, like Vertical Atlas is testing it and see what are the blind spots of that. Uh, Digital Earth has this departure point and it's, it works through these interfaces like, of course we have to use WeChat when we have to communicate with Chinese partners, whether we like it or not. Of course we are gonna use Skype or Google Hangouts just because well, we either find the budget uh, to set up our own system, or that's uh, that's not possible. So yeah, we don't we don't want to per se to um, sort of like make the stack crumble. I mean, it's not uh, really our focus. It's like that's a, I think a, a lens through which to look at this condition. But there are others, so we are on, also on the quest to kind of understand which these other ones are. And this is coming very much from the network of mentors and fellows who come from different location because, as I said. Is Dutch, I'm Italian. We have a specific point of departure that we're very aware of as well. That has strengths and shortcomings. Does this answer your okay? <laughs>
Yeah, that that's a great tip actually. I mean, we are going to ask you the name better like uh, later. Yeah, and, yeah. So we... It's Ural uh, Viennale. Okay, sorry. Okay, great. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's related to um, um, what Leonardo was just saying, like we have this free um, kind of global partners, uh, British Council, EVOS and SIDA. Um, um, so they are very generous in providing indeed the financial support to make this whole possible. Um, um, because yeah, it's kind of an open-ended resource. So it's, yeah, I think it's a unique kind of a fellowship opportunity because yeah, also it's, it's, not even so much project based, it's like really research based. So we're lucky with that. So did you hear uh, this news? Well, I think over the last week that the Russia is kind of starting this project of, of uh, isolating the Russian signal of and uh, Yeah, actually, um, funnily enough, two weeks ago, was it? Uh, we had one of these uh, research labs when we fly in experts from the region and we have a public event, it was about the Russian stock. So we are kind of fresh in, uh, from, uh, from that kind of discussion. And um, yeah, there were like different scholars mentioning s similar, similar like the bottlenecks, the gateways, and all this kind of uh, implementation of how do you say that, to redirect the traffic in, uh, in, in different ways. I don't know if it's specifically what you're mentioning, but we kind of touched upon that, uh, that type of problems, yeah. We're gonna have reports and documentation about that, I think after the Christmas break, depends when it is uh, processed, but uh, you, you can also follow it on the website and that's what we, we discussed, et cetera. A mythological stack. Yeah, almost, yeah. yeah. It can be another layer maybe in the stack. Um, um, but yeah, it's for us very new, the Cosmo Technics, um, um, as we mentioned it here like briefly, uh, but we really want to dive deeper into this um, um, yeah, idea of this, the relation between myth, uh, myths, between like cosmologies into different geographical zones in relation to yeah, technology and, and the stack. Yeah, actually, uh, in the vertical atlas, we don't address that as much. But maybe I have a very simple example. We were speaking about the sort of uh, GAFA stack versus Europe in, in September. And we had like the Estonian chief uh, innovation officer, uh, Martin Kevats, and he mentioned the Krat Kratlos. I don't know if you're familiar with that. That's, I don't know if you can call it an example of cosmotechnics. I think that's a bit of a stretch, but maybe it links to the myth. So the Krat in Estonian mythology is this uh, sort of golem, eh? this kind of uh, uh, non-human agent that can be summoned, and it's made of like all the um, kitchen appliances and house belongings that you have, so like pots and like spoons, etc. And it's animated and it can be controlled. And so that's the name they gave to this to uh, the, the branch basically of research they are doing on how to regulate algorithmic governance and artificial intelligence. So maybe it's more of a marketing strategy, but I think to an Estonian user and citizen that speaks quite clearly on what the thing is about. Um, hi, um, my question is uh, not related to digital earth, but to space, because um, if, if we're talking about space, we have a pretty opposite uh, image. We have uh, lots of da data that actually uh, um, forms forms uh, the whole vision, and uh, uh, it the, the data the data actually works as resources for your way to the physical reality. Mm -hmm. So, what do you think about this opposition? With um, space, you mean which space? Um, like cyberspace yeah. or like space? Uh, like, or? Uh, like outer space and uh, this, all this uh, hype with uh, uh, the 
terrorization of Mars and so on. Uh, like, yeah. Yeah. Like, we have outer space and we have, uh, and all we, actually, like, all we know about Venus is just data, uh, c collected data, so... Um, yeah the, yeah, the question would be also like, how would that be part of the stack? Like, um, <laughs> like, well, there is a speculative example of that, like all the um, sort of uh, new corporations that are uh, set up and invested in that promise to mine asteroids for materials that are, are going to be scarce on Earth and that can be brought back. So maybe that's um, the Earth layer that is not more the Earth layer, it's like the space layer mm -hmm. as well. And that there is, uh, if someone of you has a taste for law and uh, legal frameworks, Luxembourg is pioneering on that. Because you know that the Space Treaty, they said, anything that is outside the atmosphere, no one can own it. So actually, if you're a corporation, you go on an asteroid, technically, that's not your asteroid. So they just made a loophole for which if you bring the piece of rock in the atmosphere and you are the one bringing it, then it's yours. So all these corporations that are gonna be there in the future are all based in Luxembourg at the moment because according to this small country, that's possible and that's your rock if you bring it back. So, um, I have another question. Uh, you, you mentioned um, uh, representing uh, the digital earth uh, via artistic works, uh, particularly uh, visualization, visual, visualization, uh, and I've I've seen lots of critique uh, of uh, Anthropocene artworks because of uh, this visualization that it's like too poor style. Do you see any other ways to um, express it uh, in some in art? Um, yeah, I think we also have to wait for the research outcomes of the fellows to answer this question. But um, uh, I know the, 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 um, the mediums the fellows are using is, is quite diverse. So it's not only uh, visual, it's also haptic or sound or, or other ways. Um, uh, but yeah, we have to wait for the outcome, mm -hmm. I guess, of all the different researches. But yeah. It's, it's also a question whether you want to represent it like one-to-one -one and what mapping means. Mm -hmm. yeah actually in, in an artistic, within an artistic method. Because as we said, like often mapping leaves, I mean, it leaves out always something because maps are abstractions in the very end. So, but we'll see. Yeah, yeah we have no idea what's gonna come out. I'm looking at the fellows, right? <laughs> Please. I'm just wondering because you, you one really important, I think, or interesting for this uh, evocative quote is the fact that the, the, um, around these questions, the effects are understood, but the totality can be comprehended. Like these systems are way too vast to be potentially understood. And even when they are understood, they're understood in sometimes partial ways. And very often they're misunderstood rather than understood. So the, the legibility that people have about the, the, if you ask a random person what the internet is, more often than not, it, it's not actually going to, like their explanation is not. Yeah. So again, the, the, the ambition to create this legibility through artists, but also acknowledging that it is also flawed mm -hmm. and how to deal with that, because every view is partial. Uh, I, I guess it kind of raises the similar question to earlier, the, the, the scientist angle of building alternative models which might not be directly clear from an anthropocentric point of view. And this mm -hmm. is why I'm, I'm following up on that question. Because they, I wouldn't even claim that you guys are doing anthropocentric art. In fact, you should be doing the opposite. You should be doing art that is beyond this kind of human scale understanding and think about the system, uh, the scales of the systems, which are actually quite difficult to access as individuals. So I don't know if that's a question of, or of a comment, but uh, actually I would defend it and say, actually, no, they're not doing anthropocentric art. They're doing post anthropocentric art in that sense. Whatever that means. I think yours is a very good question, and I also think that it's unanswerable at the end. I mean, it's one of those questions that you have to keep asking, probably to get like certain results. But yeah, maybe only a non-human agent can actually make that map. Well, who are the agents that would be able to? Yeah. I'm not saying aliens. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of space, but maybe an example is also the. One of the Al Gore's projects was like he asked computer scientists to think of: Can we make a computer to map? 
how the climate works. And the outcome was like, well, if you make such a computer, then we, it's going to ask for so much electricity, we are just going to accelerate climate change to the point that there is, yeah, you don't need to map it anymore, it's just, it's just done. I mean, the, the game is over. So that's uh, perhaps is, is one of these walls with the omnisense and trying to find these com comprehensive solutions to, to this kind of problem. So yeah, partial and plural maybe are the key words of tonight. <laughs>